Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing? Woo, woo, woo. Well, let me do this. Can I open it with a word of prayer? You guys all right with that? Uh-oh. Y'all gonna have to wake up a little bit. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this day and for these amazing folks who are here this morning. I pray, God, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would allow us to hear what you want us to hear, and that we would, um, God, just be encouraged. I pray for every person watching online, every person in this room, that they would be encouraged this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Sherry, and I'm struggling. There we go. I'm (laughs) one-handed. Well, I am going to talk to you guys a little bit about motherhood, but I'm hoping that this message applies to men and women and teens and singles and marriage. It doesn't matter where you're at in life. I really believe that the the truths in this message will apply to everyone, okay? So buckle your seatbelts. Here we go. I have a question. How many of you in this room wish that you had some version or at some point in your life have wished that you had a superpower of some kind? Yeah, okay, you've dreamt of the day that you had super speed, okay, or invisibility, or telepathy, like you could do all of the things that a superhero could do. You could climb the outside of walls, you could see with x-ray vision what your child is actually doing if they're not doing their homework, right? Like, are you playing a video game, or are you actually doing homework? Well, let me just see what you're doing, right? Like, all the things, it would be so cool. Okay, when we had um, four little kids at home, we had this cool thing where our kids, you guys remember that, some of my kids are in the room right now, um, we would say, like, what, what's your superpower? And they'd be like, I have super speed. And then another one would be like, oh yeah, but, but I beat you because I have super strength. And they would go back and forth about was super strength better or super speed better, you know, and they'd go back and forth. Well, then one day while we were having this argument, my husband came up with a brilliant idea. It's like, well, what's your superpower? And he said, I have the power of I win. And we were like, what does that mean? Well, I have super strength. And he's like, doesn't matter. I win. Uh, I have super speed. It doesn't matter. I win, right? It was like so deflating to the children in the moment. They're like, oh, there's no way. He wins at all, right? It was the perfect superpower. Um, But some of us as parents, we wish we had superpowers. We wish we had all the wisdom in the world and all the strength in the world and all the ability in the world, but we always feel like we we fall flat, like we aren't quite enough. We're not smart enough, strong enough, wise enough. We're not good enough, not holy enough. And the list could go on and on. And so we kind of live beating ourselves up. I've had moments where I'm like, I literally am losing an argument with a two-year-old. How is this happening? How are they beating me right now in this argument? Or we've had days If you're moms, you're like me, you're like, this is maybe the 47th time I've asked them to pick up the dirty clothes. Why am I asking this again? What am I doing wrong that my child cannot figure this out, right? Like, what is happening that this is still an issue? Or maybe you've had those days where you're like, dude, I totally forgot to bring you your soccer jersey. And then when I showed up with the soccer jersey, I brought the wrong color. And like, now you can't play the game. Anybody else had those days where you're just like forgetful and you feel so bad. You're like, that's on me. I look silly. You look even more silly. And I'm really sorry. It's my fault, right? Like we have those days or days where you lose your temper and you're like, why do I keep losing it with my kids? I don't want to be that person. I had a conversation with a good friend when our kids were really little, like way long ago. And her comment was, I feel like I might screw up my children for life. Like I'm pretty confident that's what's gonna happen. (laughs) Like they're all gonna be in lifelong counseling because I was their mom. And so we had a good laugh about it, but there's just days, right? You don't live there, but there's days where you just feel like maybe you're not enough. I wanna give you some encouragement this morning though, okay? There's an incredible verse in Philippians 4, 17 that says, and my God will supply all, every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And my God shall supply how many needs? Every or all, all of your needs, every need. Holy cow, that's a lot. Because I feel like sometimes I got a lot of needs. And he's like, don't worry. I will supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory. I got it all figured out. I'm pretty powerful. All those superpowers you wish you had, don't worry. I got them all, right? Don't worry, I've got it. Today, I want to give us some encouragement. You may feel inadequate. You are definitely not alone. You are definitely not alone. You have a God who is right there with you and will give you what you need. So I'm going to give you four things that my God is, that your God is, okay? The first one is this. God is our strength. Everybody say that with me. God is our strength. God is our strength. 
When I was in eighth grade, I was a cross-country runner. Do I have any other runners in the room? Anybody who ran cross-country, runs cross-country? Same thing, first service. We had like three runners in our church. Wow. Good to know. Don't go running in this church because you won't find a friend. Um, <laughs> so in eighth grade, I was a cross-country runner. My whole family was. My brothers were, so I was following in suit. And I was so proud of myself because I made it to the state cross-country meet. And that was a big deal, okay? So they bust us there, we get out, and they walk us out to the starting line. Here's the starting line. Like hundreds and hundreds of middle school children all lined up, and we're going to run the state race together, okay? And so for whatever reason, luck would have it, I ended up right at the line, the starting line. I was like very close to the front, and there was a mob behind me. So they're going to shoot off the gun. The beginning of the race, you run straight down a hill, and then the path gets really narrow, and then you go straight back up a hill. How many of you already see the, the danger of this course, right? Hundreds of kids, down a hill, narrow, straight up a hill. Okay, bad idea. So I'm sprinting as fast as I can out of the thing because I want to get to the front of that pack. I don't want to get stuck behind. And the girl behind me decided she wanted in front of me, and I wasn't running fast enough, so she just ran through me. She didn't run around me. She didn't shove me, nothing. She just, like, literally ran over the top of me, which made me face plant on the ground. And, you know, there's hundreds of kids behind me now. So as I'm laying on the ground, runners are continuing to run over the top of me. That was back, I don't know if they do this now. Since we have three runners, you might not be able to answer this question. We wore these big metal spikes. You guys know what I'm talking about? Cross-country spikes because it was dirt, you know, and you're, whatever, yeah. So I'm laying on the ground, face planted on the ground, and I'm bleeding, and the girls behind me are continuing to run with their metal spikes. Somebody ran on my back of my shoulder with their spikes, and, you know, whatever. It was painful. So I'm bloodied up. I'm crying. I'm an eighth grade girl. I was probably really emotional anyways. And I'm like, ah, you know, I'm laying on the ground as runners are hopping over the top of me. And then all of a sudden, I hear this voice. Anybody know the voice of like your parents and you're like, oh, I know that voice. And it's my dad. And he's like, get up, <laughs> run. And he's like yelling at me. It sounded like he was scolding me. I'm sure it was encouragement. But he was like, get up, run the race. You're at state, run. And so I'm like, okay. And so I'm standing up wiping blood, wiping tears. And then I was like trying to get my head in the game, you know, and I finally, I kicked in. It was like, what am I doing? I'm at state. I've got to run. And I just kicked in and started trying to pick off people one at a time. I still didn't win the race. I, that's not the end of the story. But I finished the race, and I got way further up in the pack, right? Okay. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. I was waiting for that. Definitely. Here's the deal is I had to hear that voice. I was definitely done. I was face planted. I was crying. I was bloodied up. I was good to go. Let's get on the bus and go home. I'm good. But I heard somebody else's voice who was on the sidelines saying, you can do this. He believed in it. He had the strength, the, the energy in that moment to say, get up. You're going to regret laying on that ground. And that was the motivator. Some of us, we're laying on the ground and we're bloodied up and we're feeling sorry for ourselves. And you have a God in heaven who's saying, get up, run the race. I got strength for you. Like, don't quit now. It's not over. The race ain't over, okay? I want to read you guys a really awesome verse. Isaiah 40, 28 to 31 says, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Check this out. He does not faint or grow weary, period. He does not grow faint or weary. Like, that's pretty amazing. Have you ever thought of a life where you never felt tired? I can't even imagine. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases their strength. How many of you have ever had a day where you're like, God, increase my strength. I'm feeling a little tired right now, right? I, I need your strength. And then it says, even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. Then listen to this. They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. They who wait for the Lord. In the Hebrew, I looked this up. In the Hebrew, wait for the Lord meant to like to sit in expectation, to look for with expectation. I believe God's going to do something. I'm looking for with an anticipation, okay? And then it says renew their strength. The word renew in Hebrew says this. It's the idea of change or exchange or replacing. So God's saying, as you wait for me, as you look expectantly to me, I'm going to take away your weakness and I'm going to replace it with my strength, as you wait on me, I'm going to take away your weakness, your weariness, your exhaustion. I'm going to just 
put my strength into you. How many of you say, I would much rather live with God's strength than my strength? Amen? And that's what he's saying. I will replace it. I will fill you up. When Paul and Timothy faced situations that seemed so far beyond their ability to fix, so far beyond their ability to endure, in 2 Corinthians it says they learned to rely not on themselves, but on the God who raises the dead. You see, they had figured out God has an enormous amount of strength, and I don't know what I'm doing, and I don't know how to endure, but I know how to rely on the God who does, right? And that's what Paul and Timothy had figured out. It's okay to admit that you are having a rough week and that you're feeling weak and you're feeling tired. A lot of us try and power through stuff. Moms, if you're like me, you're like, I'm, got, I'm good, I got it, I'm fine. We power through and we power through and we push through. But it's okay to admit, man, I'm tired. I am weary right now. I need some extra help. When our kids were little, we had our four kids and then for a season, some of our nieces and nephews, five to be exact, um, that lived with us on and off for a couple of years. So this is, the, this is the word that I heard. Mom, will you get me a drink? Mom, can I have some lunch? Mom, will you read me a book? Mom, I have a homework. Mom, can we go to the store? Mom, can we go? Mom, mom, anybody ever heard that word before? I told Matt, it sounds like a curse word sometimes. <laughs> My children are saying a bad word right now. Can you make them stop? Literally, I was like, if they say that word one more time, I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't. I just can't any more times. No, no more moms. No. Someone else be mom. And, and he would come home for work, and I'd be like, I don't even know what they need. Could you just please answer to mom? Like, I don't even care anymore. Like, I just need somebody else to be mom for a minute. Give me a check out, like, button. And so he would do this. This is what Matt did for me, and it was so awesome. And it, still to this day, we do this for each other. But he was like, how about this? How about I take over? And you can go upstairs and you can pray and you can get alone with Jesus. You can read your Bible and just like breathe for 30 minutes or an hour, whatever you need. Just go do that. I got the kids and I'd be like, oh, yes. And I would refuel and I would fill up with the presence of God. I mean, like literally it's like, you know, like a sponge sucking back in, you know, like oh, all, the, all of the life of God. And it would refuel me. And I would do the same for him. He would have a stressful day, stressful week. And I'd say, hey, go ahead and get alone with Jesus. It's, it's fine. Go get a break. Go get a rest. Go get some solitude, whatever you need. And we did that back and forth. Now, I did learn this. There is a certain tone that you should never, ever offer that with. Like this. Honey, you need to go be alone with Jesus. Don't say it that way because it is definitely not received well, right? <laughs> like, how about you go get alone with Jesus and get better, <laughs> right? Okay, so here's the deal is offer that. But if you're single and you're here and you're like, yeah, that would be nice if I had a spouse, that would be awesome. Here's the thing. See if you have a friend, a family member, a neighbor, someone you meet at the grocery store, shake their hand, say, hi, I'm Sherry. You want some kids for a minute? I need some time with Jesus. I'm kidding. Really don't do that. But, but get alone with Jesus. Find somebody who will watch your kids 30 minutes a week even and just be super intentional and say, man, I am going to wait on the Lord because he's going to renew my strength and he's going to fill me back up with his power and with his life. Okay, God is not only our strength. God is our counselor. Everybody say, God is our counselor. Thank you. Good job, buddy. God is our counselor. When I became a parent, I realized something very quickly. I didn't know what to do all the time. I was like, I don't know exactly how many times I should change a diaper and what kind of diapers and what brand and do I use this kind or this kind and why is that better and should I feed them? Should I leave them in their bed and let them cry it out? You know what I'm talking about? Like seven million questions of how to be a mom. And all of a sudden you realize, I don't have it all figured out. And so very quickly, I read books and I asked questions, and I found all these people who would surround me and tell me all the things they've done. I joined every play group that, that I could find at the time. Our church started some play groups here once we moved here. I was like, I need everybody's advice, everybody's advice. And all of a sudden, one day, the conviction of the Holy Spirit came over me, and it was God, and he was saying, you go to everyone for counsel, but I am the greatest counselor of all times, and you're not remembering that I can help you. Like, come to me and let me be your counselor first. That doesn't mean you can't go read all those books and stuff, but like, why isn't the Bible your number one source? Why am I not your number one source to go to? And it was kind of a life change for me where I was like, oh, duh. 
I have access to free counseling 24-7. All I have to do is get alone with God and sit in his presence and read the book he already gave to me called the Bible, and he will speak to my heart and give me wisdom, and he will give me insight into my life that I can't get on my own. And as much as the people around me were incredibly helpful, and as much as those books were incredibly helpful, I became aware of the fact that Really, my time with God was the most effective form of counseling in my life. Psalm 32, verse 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye on you. I want you to hear that. I will instruct you. That's pretty awesome. I've got, a, I've got an instructor, a professor, a teacher who wants to teach me. And the second part, I will teach you in the way you should go. He's going to give us wisdom. Is it better to do this or better to do this? And this is for parents, this is for employees, this is for bosses, this applies to all of us. I will instruct you, I will teach you the way you should go, I will counsel you, that's pretty awesome. And then that last part with my eye on you, or eye upon you. Picture yourself at a park with a little kid. They're running and playing, but your eye is always on that kid. You're pretty aware if they're swinging, or on the slide, or running towards the street, right? Like, your eye is always on that kid. But you're still talking over here, solving the world's problems, who knows what. But here's the deal. That's God. God is up in heaven saying, my eye is always, I'm always aware. I'm always aware of what you're going through. And I want to help instruct you and teach you the ways you should go. James 1.5 says, if any of you needs wisdom. How many of us? If any of you needs wisdom, you should ask God for it. He will give it to you. God gives freely to everyone. There it is again. To everyone who, uh, and he doesn't find fault. He's not like, eh, don't really want to help you. You sound like a good one to help. He doesn't do that. He's like, anyone who comes to me, anyone who needs wisdom, ask, and I will give it generously. I want to help you. So many people are like, yeah, but my problems, they're too big for God. I bet in the many, many, many years that humans have been alive, God's probably had some worse cases than yours, right? Like people who had even worse situations that he was helping them through. And the reality is God's not sitting up in heaven saying, I don't want to help you. He's saying, I would love to help you. Just ask. I would love to give you counsel and wisdom. So go to God first. Before books, before friends, before spouse, go to God first. The third one here is God is our comforter. God is our comforter. Sometimes life is painful. Anybody ever experienced a little bit of pain? Good. Marty, me and you. So many of us, right? Thank you. God is loving and kind, and he sees that pain. So many of us have walked through such painful situations. And I know as a mom, it has been excruciatingly painful at times watching my own children suffer, right? Because they've gone through difficult times, and I haven't been able to save them from pain. That has been so hard to really grasp and to grab a hold of, like, I want to be there for my kids and they're hurting, and I, I can't take away the pain, right? We suffer, our kids suffer, and God's saying, I am the God who can comfort you. For Psalm 147 verse 3 says, he heals the brokenhearted, and he binds up their wounds. He heals the brokenhearted when our heart has been torn in pieces from whatever our circumstance. Maybe it's something that happened to your child or is happening in your child's life, and you can't save them from the pain, and it is breaking your heart. Or maybe it's something that your child has done to you and is painful and they have tr mistreated you and it is hurting you and has deep wounds within your heart. I don't know what you're walking through, but I know this. God has made this promise. He heals your broken heart. And then it says he binds up your wounds. That means to literally take and wrap up tightly and then put pressure on it. Like he binds up your wounds. If you've had a really bad wound, a bloody wound, you know, like, compression, like hold it tight, right? Like make the blood stop. That's what God does for our hearts. He's like, I want you to know moms, dads, teens, God is your comforter. He wants to comfort you when you're hurting. He sees you. His eye is always on you and he cares deeply. In 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 4, it says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of mercies. And then listen to this phrase, the God of all comfort. Nothing greater, no one greater, the God of all comfort. And then he says this phrase, which is kind of cool, and he's basically like, he's going to comfort you so you can be a channel of comfort to help someone else. 
And I want to encourage you, if you have a kid who is suffering, a family member who is suffering, go to God and get your comfort and your assurance and your peace and your love and your, like, all of that filled up in your life. Like, let God love on you and heal and restore you so that you can be a channel of love to those people in your life who are hurting and who are broken. Because, man, we want to continue to to be that funnel that God can flow through. But here's the thing. How do you find that comfort? Again, take some time in prayer. Take some time alone with God. Go find a quiet space. Get alone with him. Ask him, God, would you heal my broken heart, my broken pieces of my heart? And God, would you bind up these wounds that are just kind of continuing to be open wounds? God, would you heal and would you restore The same is true for our kids, right? Believe that God is a God of all comfort for your kid when they're hurting. Believe, God, you are enough to comfort them. I see something with moms. I'm just gonna be honest because I am a mom. I see this pattern. A lot of times we have needs that go unmet. We don't go to God for for our needs to be met. We, We tend to sometimes forget that and we go to other people. And one of the groups of people sometimes that moms go to is their children. And they want their children to meet their emotional needs and to fill up those empty places in their hearts and to encourage them and strengthen them. They want to be buddies with their friends. And that's good. And there's a time and a season for friendship with your kids. Obviously, we're entering this young adult phase, and it's awesome because I do. I feel like I'm more friends with my kids now. But here's the danger. They are still humans. They cannot meet every part of the needs of my heart, right? And so if I put all of my dependence and my um, reliance on my kids to meet those needs, how many of you know my heart is going to be broken, right? They're independent souls. I need to let them fly and be free and not feel the weight of mommy's needs, right? But I also, they may pull their love away for a while, and it will crush you as a mom, as a dad. So we got to stop depending on our kids' love to meet our needs, And we need to go to the source of all love, which is God. And say, God, I need you to fulfill my needs. I need you to be the God of all comfort who brings healing and restoration. And I can't depend on my children. I cannot depend on my husband. I cannot depend on my parents to meet those needs. Instead, I go to God. He is the source of all comfort. Amen? Amen. Okay. This morning, um, our last point is this. God is our advocate. God is our advocate. I love this concept of God is our advocate. He's, he's our lawyer. He's the one who fights for us. He's the one who defends us and protects us. He stands by our side. So many people, so many people, Christians alike, Christian and non-Christian alike, they live feeling guilty and beat up. They feel shame a lot or a lot of the time. There's this thing that like hashtag mom fail I actually looked it up, and then I was like, yeah, I I just can't even put those pictures on the screen, just because it's like mom's just beating themselves up, right? Like, yeah, all of us fail. Obviously, we're human. But so many people live kind of under the weight of this feeling of guilt and shame. And I, I wanted to hit this this morning because I think it's really important for us to realize that when we're in that, like, continual spin cycle of just bashing our head up against the wall in defeat and shame and regret, There is no victory in that, right? Like there's no joy in that. Christians should not be living their lives defeated with their heads hung down and they're just feeling horrible about themselves all the time. Guys, we have been set free, right? Like that's the whole thing is Jesus died on the cross to set us free. We don't have to live that way anymore. And he is the one who's there standing by our side, defending us and protecting us forever, forever, forever. The heavy weight of guilt and regret we carry, that is not from God. If you're walking around feeling just continually heavy with guilt and regret, Let me tell you, there's freedom for you this morning. Romans 8, 1 and 2 says, there is now no condemnation for those who who belong to Christ Jesus. There's none, no condemnation. It says, because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. He's freed you. You're not, there is no judgment. There is no one standing up in heaven saying, you're a sinner, you're a failure, You should be ashamed of yourself. No one's doing that. He's saying, you have been set free. He's already done the work. He's like, I died on the cross so you didn't have to live condemned. I died on the cross so you could live free from guilt and shame. 
Why do we do this? Why do we do this? Two reasons. The first reason may be this. The Holy Spirit may be bringing conviction into your life. The Holy Spirit may be saying, you know what? There is this sin that you're not dealing with. And today, you need to repent of that sin. You need to say, I'm sorry for my sin and the way that I am hurting my people and my family. I'm sorry for the way that I am behaving. I'm sorry for whatever it is. But we don't just say, I'm sorry. We turn and we walk the other way. And we begin to live a different life. And when you do that, there is total, absolute freedom. God is saying, your sins are gone as far as the east is from the West. Your sins are gone. I don't hold them against you anymore. And I'm going to stand by your side and continue to say, she's free. He's free. He's not guilty anymore. He's going to advocate on our behalf. But there's a second thing that we do to ourselves. Maybe, maybe the Holy Spirit's convicting us, or maybe we're just in this continual cycle of comparison. But I'm not as good of a mom as she is, but I'm not as good of an employee as they are. But I don't have as much money as, but I don't whatever it is. And can I encourage you with this? If you're living a life of comparison, it'll, it'll kind of eat you up. It'll always make you feel like you're less than. As our kids hit high school, man, there was so much pressure to spend so much money on stuff. Like all of the kids at the school, my kids were starting high school and drove these crazy awesome cars. And I was like, oh my goodness, are you kidding me? There's no way. Sorry, I hope you like your little cheapy car because that's what we can afford. But there's this part of you that's like, ah, oh, I wish I could do that for my kid. We had a kid whose friend had a, a birthday party at a crazy fancy restaurant in the city and they took a limo up there and, you know, and then I was like, what do you want to do for your birthday, honey? We could go hiking, you know, <laughs> like, like, oh my goodness. And what happens is you start to compare and say, like, I could never do that for my kids. What if I'm not a good parent? What if I'm not a good enough grandparent? What, am I, what, if, what if I'm not doing enough? Can I tell you that's a super dangerous trap? You'll always find somebody who has more money, who has more stuff, who did something creative and loved to, to, to post about it on Instagram. It doesn't necessarily mean what happens in their home is healthier. You know that right? All you have to do is worry about who you are and how you're, how you're living your life according to Christ. Am I doing everything I can today to honor Christ, to glorify God in my home, with my children, with my husband, with my workplace as a single? Am I honoring God and glorifying God in everything I'm saying and doing? Because I only stand in front of an audience of one. At the end of my life, I only have to hear, well done, good and faithful servant from one. That's it. I don't care what somebody thinks on Instagram the day I die, right? Nobody cares anymore. I just stand before Jesus. There's an awesome verse about this whole comparison trap. Galatians 6, 4 says, Let everyone be sure that he is doing his very best, for then he will have the personal satisfaction of work well done. He will not need to compare himself with someone else. Man, wouldn't it be awesome if we, as Christians, got to a place where we said, I don't have to prove myself to anyone anyone besides Jesus. I'm going to work my tail off to honor him and glorify him and be close to him. But I don't have to worry about comparing myself to anyone else. I'm going to stand with satisfaction and confidence today and enjoy my time with my family today and not let any of the rest of that matter. So today, I want to read one more quote to you, actually. Lisa Turkhurst, she's a fantastic Christian speaker. She says this, you are fully loved and accepted right now just as you are, sinful and flawed. How many of us are sinful and flawed? All of us. We are and are, we were and are secure in God's love only because of Jesus. And then she uses this picture. She says, when you fall into a pit, Jesus doesn't throw you a ladder. She said, he jumps down into the pit with you and he picks you up in his loving arms and he carries you out of the pit. And some of you are here this morning and you're like, I, I love the fact that Jesus or that God is strong and mighty, and I need him to carry me up out of that pit of depression and guilt and shame and worry and anxiety, whatever it is. This morning, I don't know what you're carrying that's so heavy, but God's saying, I am a God of comfort. I am a God who will counsel you, and if you will let me, I will help you. But here's what we do. We hold in our hands 
our kids, our finances, our job, our career, our future, all of the things, our hopes and dreams, all the things we're going to prove to the world, I can do this. We power through and we keep holding on tight like this is mine. I've got it. I'll figure it out. And we hold on super tight. And God's saying, would you take that and would you release those fingers and would you lay those things at the foot of my cross? Would you let me take those things from you? Would you let me do it? Because guess what? I'm smarter and I'm stronger and I'm, I have more wisdom and I can help you in your time of need if we will release those things to him. But we hold so tight. We're going to figure it out. God's saying, would you release those things? And then he's saying, now, will you flip that hand over and would you receive all of those things? I'm trying to exchange your weakness with my strength trying to take away your lack of wisdom and put my wisdom into your heart and into your life, my counsel, my direction, my peace, my forgiveness. So I'm gonna ask us all to do this. We're gonna bow our heads and we're actually gonna, if I had two, I would do two, but I only have one hand. We're gonna, we're gonna hold our hands out this morning. So would you do that? Would you close your eyes with me this morning? Would you hold out both hands? And as you do, would you imagine in your own mind, in your own heart, what is it that you're holding in that hand and you've been trying to do it on your own strength and you've been trying to do it on your own wisdom and you've been holding on for dear life and today you're gonna let go Jesus today we hold in our hands tightly all of the things we think we are so smart about strong enough to do but God we're gonna make a choice today to let you be the Lord of our life and to let you take over. And, and, and we believe by faith that, God, you are so much stronger, so much wiser, so much better at all of this thing called life than we are. And so we release those things to you today. And that, if that's you this morning, would you release those things? Would you let them go? Would you just, Lord, uh, open your hand this morning? And God, we release these to you. We lay them at your cross. We lay them at the foot of your cross. And we say, Jesus, forgive. Jesus, take over. Jesus, you're in charge of my life. I don't want to be in charge anymore. And then one last thing, would you lift your hands up to heaven? Would you raise your hand or open your hand back up and say, God, I accept your wisdom. God, I accept your strength. God, I accept your authority and your divinity. I accept your forgiveness fully. I don't want to live guilty and ashamed anymore. Lord, I pray that for every person in this room, we accept what you have for our lives. God, we choose to do it your way in this place today. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen.